Okay, so now it's recording. Um, this is going to be the big session, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. today. Um, we're going to cover like all three practice exams that I have up on Google Drive. And um, basically, they'll be kind of separated into three different videos. Each one is going to be uploaded um, on YouTube. They should take like roughly like two, two and a half hours, three at the max. Um, but yeah, I'll be here at the MSLC, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., like I said. And hopefully these videos should be helpful for those who are watching online. And then for those who come in person, hope those are helpful too. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on the first problem. Um, just to kind of preface this for those who are watching online, I'm going to be writing stuff like all the equations and everything to work out on my iPad first. And then I'll just kind of go back like write stuff on the whiteboard um, just in person as well so people here know what I'm talking about and stuff and they can follow along. But um, yeah, first problem is on the first practice exam, the, that first problem should be the magnetic fields in forces question. It says a heavy ion has a charge of magnitude absolute value Q is equal to E. So that's the charge of an electron, right? Um, and that's just the magnitude of it. And that's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? And then it says that heavy ion travels with a speed of five times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So that gives us our velocity, our speed here, five times 10 to the fifth meters per second, right? Inside the solenoid, right? So remember a solenoid is like a current carrying wire that has like a bunch of loops together. So you have like a regular circular loop and then you also have just kind of like a bunch of coils together. That's what a solenoid is. Um, so just a, a bunch of circular loops together. And then it um, says the uniform magnetic field is B is equal to 0 0.5 Teslas, right? And that's into the page, okay? So when they give you a direction like that, we're probably gonna have to use some kind of like right-hand rule stuff later on. Um, and so it says the trajectory on the plane of the page is shown in the picture, right? So they have in that problem, they kind of have the circle here, right? And then they have the into the page kind of direction here, which is X's. So X's are into the page when we're looking at magnetic fields, right? Um, and then you have like your circle, like little dots that indicates like out of the page, right? Um, and then they have the direction of the actual like particle is kind of off to the left like this. So let me select a different like marker here or something. A sec, all right, so there and it's kind of going in a circle like this and it's moving off to the left. So that's our velocity there. And they have the force. Um, well, actually we're going to define the force here in a second. Got ahead of myself there with the right hand rule stuff, but part a, they're asking about to determine the magnetic force, magnitude and direction acting on the ion when at the location shown, right? So that location right here, we're trying to figure out what the um, magnetic force is going to be, right? So for magnetic force, we use the right-hand rule, right? So we have our thumb pointing in the direction of the velocity, or like the motion of the actual particle, kind of like to the left like this. Then we have our index finger pointing in the direction of the magnetic field, so that's into the page like that, right? And then we just have our middle finger pointing in the direction that's natural to that. Right, and it's all has to be perpendicular. So you can't like have your middle finger kind of pointing at an angle or anything like that. It has to be all specifically perpendicular, right hand, right angles to each other, right? And so if you do that, thumb to the left, index finger inwards, and then your middle finger should point downwards, right? So that means that the force should be pointing downwards for this. So let me draw that out real quick. So magnetic force is pointing downwards uh, towards the middle of the circle, kind of radially inwards, which makes sense because in order for it to maintain that circular motion, right, we want it to have that centripetal force, basically. So the magnetic force is kind of acting as that centripetal force to keep it going in a circle, right? Um, now, and this is like for a different scenario, and I think you guys had this on the quiz before. So if you have um, a negative particle, for example, then if you were to do that right-hand rule, thumb to the left, index finger inwards, then your right hand rule will show that the force is downward, but for a negative particle, upwards basically. Here. So you just reverse the direction essentially. Um, so whatever direction you have for the uh, magnetic force, it should be the opposite of that for a negative particle. 
Um, so like if they were to ask you like, is this a negative or a positive particle here? Then you have to say it's a positive particle, right? Because in order to have that circular motion, your force has to be pointing in that downwards direction. And so based on the right hand rule, if we're using this, the right hand rule is determined or is based on like a positive particle. So because it's pointing downwards, right? And it's matching up with that circular motion with that centripetal force, then we know it's going to be a positive particle, right? Now, um, let's say for example, if the particle was moving to the right instead. So thumb to the right, index finger inwards, then the force is pointing upwards, right? So that way, if it says, if it's moving essentially clockwise in that case, instead of counterclockwise, then we know that this has, this isn't a positive particle because the magnetic force will be pointing upwards rather than downwards towards the center of the circle. So if we do the right hand rule, we see that the magnetic force is pointing upwards, right? And then the opposite of that, so the negative particle would have the magnetic force pointing downwards. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. right? So it should be pointing downwards for that negative particle and that, that's how we know whether it's a positive or negative particle based on the direction of the magnetic force um, and then the movement, like if you're going counterclockwise, clockwise, pointing to the left, pointing to the right. Um, but yeah. And let me know if you have any questions as well, so um, feel free to ask. But that kind of gives us our direction of the magnetic force, so we know that it's pointing downwards, right? And now we just have to figure out the magnetic force's magnitude, right? So we have magnetic force, and there should be equations. So if we pull up the equation sheet here, I want to pull it up here just to make sure that I'm not... Um, saying anything incorrectly so give me one second here but it should be for magnetic force is equal to the particle times the perpendicular component of the velocity times the um, magnetic field so and by particle I mean like the charge of the particle so QVB should be the equation that you use for that um, so let me just double check yep so FB our magnetic force is equal to the absolute value of the charge right times the perpendicular component of the velocity times the absolute value or the magnitude of the magnetic field as well, right? So they gave us a lot of these values already. We know what the velocity is. Um, we know what the charge is. And then uh, we have the magnetic field as well, right? So simple plug and chug at this point because we have the charge, which is that 1.6 times 7 to the negative 19 coulombs. And they already said we want the absolute value of it. So that's for a charge of an electron, right? But it's the same also for a proton, and so that's why they're kind of like doing the magnitude of it in this case, because um, it also matches up with the context of the problem, because you're looking at a positive particle, which we kind of determined earlier. Um, so with that being said, right, we have the charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We have our speed, right, or our velocity here, which is 5 times 10 to the fifth. And when we're talking about like perpendicular component, it's because you have with the right hand rule, everything is at a perpendicular angle to each other. So your, cur your um, not your current, but like your movement of your particle, your magnetic field and your force are all at 90 degree angles to one another. And so in this case, when they give you the speed and given the context of this problem, that's just the perpendicular component anyway, right? Um, because that's just how the problem is kind of set up. But you might experience or you might encounter like a problem that will have the particle kind of moving at an angle, right? So it might be, kind of up and to the right, for example, so it might look like this, where the velocity or the speed of the particle is kind of up and to the right. And in that case, that might give you an angle like 30 degrees or something like that. And let's say the magnetic field is pointing upwards like this. So this is your B. Now, in order to figure out the perpendicular component, well, it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? So we're looking for kind of like this part right here. So just how it moves across the X axis, if that makes sense, right? So in order to do that, you can just use your trig identities, right? So let's say your speed is 10 meters per second. So then you do like 10 meters per second times cosine 30, and that'll give you like the perpendicular component of the velocity because it has to be at a right angle to the, um, to the magnetic field. So let me go ahead and erase that here for a sec and continue with the problem. So yeah, so we have five times 10 to the fifth meters per second, right? And then we have our magnetic field, which is 0 0.5 Teslas. And then that should give us, and I'm just going based off the um, key here, that should be like four times seven to the negative 14 Newton. So if you wanna go ahead and check that as well, that'd be great just to kind of confirm. But that's what I have um, on my end, four times seven to the negative 14. Yep, sounds good. Um, so that's not too bad so far. Uh, now they're asking for the charge of the particle, positive or negative, which we kind of addressed earlier, right? And that's solely just based on 
kind of the directions that you observe with the right hand rule and how it matches up with the context of the problem. So we had our thumb kind of pointing off into the left, right? That's our V, our velocity. And then we had our, um, let me actually kind of write this off to the, to the left here. So this is our thumb. And then we had our magnetic field kind of pointing inwards into the page, right? So that's kind of, if I had to do that kind of like that, that's our magnetic field. And then if you just follow the right hand rule, your magnetic force should be pointing downwards um, towards the center of the circle, right? That's our FB. And because it's pointing towards the center of the circle radially inwards, right? It's able to maintain that centripetal motion, like I said. And so the right hand rule is based on the positive particle. So if you see the force pointing towards the center of the circle, right? Normally, which is what we want, then you know that that particle is positive, right? So as long as the force is matching up to the center of the circle, then we know that it's positive, right? Otherwise, if it's not, like I said, so let's say for example, if your movement of your particle or your thumb is pointing to the right and your um, index finger, your magnetic field is still pointing into the page inwards, then you have your magnetic force pointing upwards. So that's not towards the center of the circle. So we know that it's not a positive particle because the right hand rule doesn't match up with what we need to see for the centripetal motion, right? So in that case, we would say it would be a negative particle because the negative particle would be the exact opposite of what you see with the right hand rule. So if you see a magnetic force pointing upwards, right, then a negative particle would have that pointing downwards. So we would say then in that case, if the particle is moving to the right, so clockwise that way, then we would say that would be a negative particle because in that case you would have or you would see the magnetic force pointing downwards, radially inwards, and that would kind of confirm and um, make sense with the centripetal motion that we're wanting to observe. But in this case, we know it's a positive particle, right? Because based on that right hand rule, thumb to the left, index finger inwards for the end of the page magnetic field, we have our magnetic force pointing downwards towards the center of the circle, and that matches up with everything, right? So the, the idea is that we want things to match up with having that centripetal motion and then checking that with like the positive nature of the right hand rule, if that makes sense, right? So that's the idea. So that's how we know that the charge of the particle is positive here. Um, so now we have problem two, all right, let me move on to that. So magnetic fields, sources, so we have point P in the picture is two centimeters away from a wire with a current of I is equal to two amps, right? We have this wire here at point P and that's two centimeters away. And they're asking to determine the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field created by the current at point P, right? So we're wanting to look at the magnetic field magnitude here, right? Um, let's see here, what information do we have about this wire? So when you have a current carrying wire like this, there's a standard equation to figure out the magnetic field for it. And that's the, uh, I think it's called the permittivity constant, if I'm not mistaken. And then multiplied by your current and then divided by two pi r, right? And r is basically like the distance you are away from a specific point that you're looking at. So in this case, our r would be like our two centimeters, but obviously we want things to be in meters for SI units, so we have to make that 0 0.02 meters, right? Um, but with that being said, we just kind of plug and chug at this point, right? So, so with our permittivity constant, it's four pi times 10 to the negative seven. Um, I think that's like Tesla's times meters per amp. Um, and it should all make sense, right? Because all the units should cancel out. And then you have your current, which is two amps, and then divided by two pi, and then times 0 0.02 meters, right? Because that distance, that point P is two centimeters away, and that's 0 0.02 meters away at the same, same, same thing. Um, and then that, if you want to go ahead and check that as well, I think that should be two times 10 to the negative five Teslas. So that gives us our magnetic field that, at that point, right? Now they also want us to figure out what the direction is, right? So for our direction, we have um, the right hand rule. This technically the one that we used in the previous problem was the second right hand rule. This is the first right hand rule, which is like for, for current carrying wires, we have like our thumb pointing in the direction of the current. And then we wrap our fingers around in the direction of like, that'll be the direction of the magnetic field. So thumb pointing downwards, and then we kind of wrap it around. So like if you're looking at this like on your table basically or on your desk when you're solving this in the exam, then you would have kind of like put your thumb down flat on the table, right? And then kind of raise your other fingers kind of upwards like that and kind of wrap them around 
at that specific point. So that point is to the left of the wire. So if you wrap it around like this and kind of like knock on the table, right, then you can see it kind of going into the table or into the page, right? So that makes sense. Um, and then on the other hand, right, on the other direction, right, assuming that we're still going downwards, then if you kind of do it in the air now, well, to the left of the wire, it's into the page. So you're kind of going downwards and into the page or into the table, right? And then if you kind of wrap your hands around more, you'll see that it kind of curls back around to that right of the wire and that goes out of the page, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always like one side is kind of one direction and the other side is a different direction. Um, so to the left, it's into the page, and to the right, it's going to be out of the page. And you can see that just by kind of curling your hands. Um, so this is into the page at point P because it's to the left of the wire. Okay, so that's part A, right? And now part B, we're looking at a particle of charge Q is equal to negative 25 microcoulombs at point P moves left away from the wire with a speed four times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So we have our speed, four times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Um, our charge is Q equals negative 25 microcoulombs, right? And then um, it's moving away from the wire. So it's kind of moving to the left here, right? So let me kind of redraw the wire again. We have this particle here, it's moving to the left um, and it's negative like we said, right? Um, we have our current still kind of pointing downwards like this. So they want us to determine the magnitude and direction of the force on the particle, right? Determine the magnitude and direction of the force on the particle. Well, to determine like magnitudes and direction of anything with respect to like particles and not like current carrying wires, we use a second right hand rule, right? Which is the thumb, index finger, and the middle finger, right? So we know that the particle is moving left, so kind of point our thumbs to the left, and now we know that the magnetic field is pointing into the page, right? Because that's that's where point P is at. So that's into the page. So we should see that our force is pointing downwards, right? But here's the, th here's the thing. Did we say it's a positive or a negative particle? It's a negative particle, right? And we know that the right-hand rule is based on positive particles. So if you have the force pointing downwards, then the force should be pointing upwards for a negative particle, right? So right-hand rule will show downwards, but you have to flip it to be upwards for a negative particle, right? So you just have to flip it for, for it being a negative particle. You kind of have to account for that. Um, so in this case, right, we would have it pointing upwards, right? Now, um, we have to find out the magnitude of the force as well, right? So once again, force, magnetic force here, that's just QVB, right? So that is the um, magnitude of the charge. So let me kind of rewrite that out actually. So magnitude of the charge times the perpendicular component of the velocity um, and then times the magnitude of the magnetic field, right? So we have our magnetic field from, from before. That was the two times 10 to the negative five Teslas. We have our perpendicular component of velocity. So remember, we're not doing this at a different angle or anything like that. We're just assuming that everything's kind of perpendicular to one another. Um, so whatever you see here with the velocity, which is four times 10 to the fifth, you don't have to do any like sine or cosine or anything like that because it's just all at 90 degrees. So we have our charge as well as that negative 25 microcoulombs, right? And we're gonna turn that into positive because it's taking the magnitude. So we have 25 times 10 to the negative six coulombs because we have to convert things into SI units, right? Um, and then you just multiply by your perpendicular component of your velocity. So that's four times 10 to the fifth meters per second, and then multiplied by the magnetic field um, that we got before, which is that two times 10 to the negative fifth Teslas, right? And then just going based on the key, and we're gonna check this here in a sec, um, should be, I think, two times 10 to the negative four. Newtons is your, your force here. Um, but yeah, so I think one thing that I want to add as well to this problem, um, and you're going to see this probably in, in other problems, I don't know if on this exam or other practice exams, but basically um, there's kind of like a notation that you can kind of choose for figuring out whether you want to assign um, into the page as being a positive magnetic field or out of the page being negative. So me personally, I like to say that into the page is positive magnetic field and out of the page is negative. 
And I'm not just saying that just because I just kind of based that on the problems that they have in the reading. So in the reading, they kind of views um, into the page as being positive magnetic field, like positive B, and out of the page is negative. That's how they usually solve their problems. I've seen it on some answer keys for the quizzes and stuff being the opposite way, um, where you have into the page is negative and out of the page is positive, but it really doesn't matter as long as you're consistent with what you're doing. And usually all these problems is, are just asking for um, like magnitude of the magnetic field in the end. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would probably just do the into the page is positive and out of the page is negative. That has worked for me. I've gotten full points on a lot of these magnetic uh, field problems before. So um, I think that's probably the safest bet. So yeah, no, I don't mean to flex, but I'm just saying like that's, that's what I've done and it's worked for me. So like, it, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's probably all for, for that problem. And we checked the, um, mm -hmm. the force there. Jesus, awesome. The Sweet. So now we can move on to problem three, right? So that's your refraction uh, problems. So it says light refracts between parallel glass air and air glass interfaces, right? Which of the following diagrams best shows the way light will refract? So you have, I don't know if I should draw this out here on the paper. I'll just go ahead and do it. And then while I do this, I will also at the same time kind of like pull up the reading just to kind of reference this and make sure that I'm not saying anything in incorrectly. But basically, to figure out like how the arrows will kind of point, right, is looking at whether they point towards the normal or away from the normal, right? So where you have, it, it kind of depends basically on whether you're moving from a material that has a higher index of refraction to a lower index of refraction or vice versa if you're moving from low to high. So high to low versus low to high index of refraction will cause that difference in whether or not the ray will point towards the normal or away from the normal basically. Right? So essentially for all these you just have two pieces of the glass um, kind of there and then just in between is just air. So let me pull up, uh, actually no I'll just pull up my slides honestly because I think that's just a little bit quicker. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So, yeah, so if you're moving from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, light will bend towards the normal line. Um, but if you're moving from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction, the light will bend away from the normal line. Right, so um, let me go back to the problem here. So in this case, we have all of these um, like different options here for the glass and the air kind of interface here. So if we look at kind of an incident ray coming in like this, right? Actually, let me just kind of draw it up until the very end. And let me do a different color for the normal line. So remember the normal line is kind of um, that vertical line that will, um, I guess, the rays will come into contact with. And then that normal line will kind of be perpendicular. Um, or I guess we measure our angles relative to that normal line, basically. Um, and so here, you kind of see you have this angle there theta, that's our incident angle. And then based on whether you're moving from high index of refraction to low or low to high, it'll either kind of move closer to the normal line or move farther away. So um, in this case, and that's kind of based on um, Snell's law, which is your first index of refraction times sine theta. So that's your incident angle for the first like material. And then that's equal to the, in, the second index of refraction times sine of that angle as well, the refracted angle, right? So um, for either piece of glass, you're going to have like the same sort of angle, right? Um, but the idea is that once you kind of go through that air, it'll be refracted a little bit and then it'll be kind of refracted again once you go back into glass, right? So for this let me take a look here so we have glass glass i believe is 
is that higher index of refraction? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because air is, air is, air has an index of refraction of one, and everything is going to be higher than that, basically, right? So if you're moving once again from high to low, right, then light will bend away from the normal line, right? So you should kind of see it go like this, right? Um, I'm trying to think, uh, trying to remember like how I explained to like, how I explained visualizing this, um, looking at this normal line stuff. Okay, give me one second. I just want to remember how I like did this. <laughs> okay, so all right. So it should refract away from the normal line. I remember talking about this in my uh, review, but for some reason I can't remember like what analogy I made or what example I used to figure out like, or how to better see like if it's bending towards the normal line or not. kind of visualize it like here you just have that red line so if I kind of go in okay now I remember all right so basically the idea is that you want to look at your ray um, as if it was totally unobstru unobstructed right so imagine if there was no like difference in the media there like if you just had all glass then the ray would kind of just go like this in that same line in that same direction right now moving towards the normal line we kind of look like this, right? So you're kind of getting closer to that red line and then moving away from the normal, um, we kind of look like that where you're moving away clearly from the red line. So the way I, I finally remembered it, but the way that you should go about this is kind of like draw the rest of that line as if it was all glass, right? And then kind of see if it's, obviously like since we have high to low, like we said, right? So high to low will mean that it bends away from the normal line. So you should be looking at answer options that are not like getting closer. Like they shouldn't be this direction, like getting closer to that red line. They should be kind of this direction, that green line here. Um, so if you, if you want to take a look at that as well, like you kind of see that, right? Yeah, that um, Does that have to normally draw mm -hmm. the Exactly, right? So that's kind of how the setup should be, at least in that area kind of between air and glass. And then once we kind of go back, look, we just continued that line, right? Then we have this incident angle with the normal line for the other piece of glass, right? And then since we're moving now from low um, to high, right? Then this should be moving towards the normal line, right? So in this case, if we just kind of like continued it on, oops, if we continued that green line, then this should be moving towards um, the normal line, right? So it should kind of go like this, sort of. Kind of getting closer to the normal line there. Um, but yeah. So kind of looking at those options then, let's see here, so to match up this drawing, and let me actually do a different color here so you guys can see this one. Oops, hold up. It shouldn't be the green one that we're looking at because the green one is kind of like, um, actually, no, yeah, yeah, we're good, we're good. It's the green one, it's the green one. I was looking at the blue one for some reason. Yeah, it's the green one. The green one will point away, will refract away, and then the yellow one will have to refract towards the normal. Um, so let's see here. 
So between A, B, C, and D. A looks a little weird though. I'm not sure if that's a mistake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see here. C looks all right between the first piece of glass and the air. Um, C looks more correct to me. But I'm not 100% sure. B, B is totally wrong. Um, D is totally wrong. I'm between A and C because... Yeah, go ahead. Then, like, bends away from the normal, which is consistent between mm -hmm. the first glass and air for A. Yep. And then low to high, because you're going back into glass, so the line should be closer to the normal, so it should be closer to the red line. Yeah. So I think it's okay. Wait, hold up. A is... Unless I have... <laughs> okay. But... I mean, based on how we drew it, I mean, if you look at that answer option A, then you have that kind of getting farther away from the normal line, right? Because if we have that red line like that, then like if we just continued that green line, like I said, like this, then kind of going this way would be away and this way would be towards. Do you see what I mean? Like, let me draw it up on the board as well. So, oh, the first. Um, that'll be the um. Yeah, the solenoid at the beginning. So with that problem three, right? So we had a piece of glass. Right, another piece of glass, and then basically we had incident ray kind of come in like this. Yeah, that'd be great. And then we have going from high to low to high again, right? So going high to low, it'll tend to refract towards the normal line, mm -hmm. right? So here's our normal line basically like this. And so, like I said, if we continued that line like that, Wouldn't you then draw it like the way they drew it with the dash red line? Like I mean, to the that, like that, that is just showing you like that's where the incident is, like just mm -hmm. where it hits basically. But this is the no like the normal line is like that kind of perpendicular, like a vertical line right there that we're referencing basically, right? Um, and so unless I have that totally wrong, maybe I'm just looking like you said, maybe I'm just looking at the wrong line. Because I always thought it was just like perpendicular to the surface, I guess. All right, hold up. Let me look at that again. But you're kind of looking at it like left to right, so I mm -hmm. assume it would be like more of an x-axis, sort of perpendicular normal force, rather than mm -hmm. like looking at the y-axis. If I remember correctly, when it comes to these kinds of problems, the larger yeah. the reflective index is, then it's an inverse. If one increases, then the other will decrease. So mm -hmm. if the index increases, then the in angle for one will be greater than the other, right? Um, I think so. I think it just up. like sort of. I don't know how to describe it. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. So, yeah, the I see what I did yeah. wrong here. So, I was looking at the definition of things in terms of like having a, a horizontal surface instead of a vertical surface. That that mm -hmm. was my issue. Um, so, I should like, I forgot my own definition of the normal line, which is it's perpendicular to the surface of, like where the ray hits basically, mm -hmm. right? So the ray is hitting here like this at a vertical line. Mm -hmm. So the normal line would actually be that horizontal yeah. line, my bad. So the, yeah, like what you said, so great. Um, good job, excellent great, job. Great. Um, but yeah, so that's your horizontal line. That should be your, your normal line there because that's gonna be perpendicular to where it actually hits. Mm -hmm. So it hits this vertical surface. Yeah. And so your normal line would have to be that horizontal surface, right? So if we're going high to low once again, just so I'm not like mm -hmm. being stupid, right? If we're going high to low, then it'll bend away from the normal line, right? Um, and so in this case, like, what do they have it as? Yeah. 
So, hold up, we have a Kleenex here. Right? Mm. Yeah. So, if this is our normal line, right, and we're trying to bend away from it. So, like, if we just drew a continuation of a line like this, then away from it would just kind of be like that way, sort of. So, you're kind of getting away from that horizontal line, right? So, it should kind of bend away from it. This way, sort of. I don't know. My, this is not incredibly drawn to scale. So let me actually like continue this down. So that's what I think. Would, so if I'm doing this way, so then the answer would be A. Yep. Answer would be A. Yep. So I I made the mistake of thinking of that as the vertical line was the normal mm -hmm. instead of the horizontal line. So if we were to continue this right, where we still have that horizontal line as our normal line, right? Then going. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a great drawing. Uh, low to high, right? Low to high will be um, towards, the towards the normal, right? And so then, once again, if you just kind of continue that line like this, then towards the normal should be this way because mm -hmm. you're getting closer to that um, horizontal line. Does that make sense? Or I can draw it again because I know it's no, not to no, scale. It's, it's kind of like what I was just kind of yeah. saying, like large, large uh, reflect. Reflection index mm -hmm. will mean small angle and vice versa. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, and then let me draw it here again because I screwed up this this drawing. So let me redo that. This is being for, recorded. Right? Yep, it's being recorded. Mm -hmm. So all right, let me kind of redraw this here. So my mistake was that I considered the vertical line there to be the normal line. Instead, it should be the horizontal line because the normal line will be defined as that surface that's perpendicular to where the ray is hitting, right? So we have this piece of glass here again, another piece of glass. We have this incident ray, and then we have this, our, this is our normal line. The dotted line here is our normal. And so, like I said, we can just kind of continue that ray on and then it's supposed to be getting um, away or moving away from the normal because we're going from a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction, right? So away from the normal is away from this dotted line here. So we want it where it kind of bends like this, where it's away from that horizontal line. It's getting farther from it. So if I just can actually draw things properly, right? where it's kind of bended away, and then I just have to, I guess, just extend this drawing. I don't know why this is so stupid. I'm stupid, not not the drawing. <laughs> um, so let me, so OK. I'm not an artist, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not an artist, guys. <laughs> so there we have the normal line again, right? And now we're trying to get. Um, closer to the normal line because we're moving from an, an index of refraction that's lower to an index of refraction that's higher. So once again, if we can kind of continued that line, we want to get closer to this line over here, this dotted line. So it kind of looked like this, which once again, that'll match up with A, right? So essentially you should kind of have it where it looks like this, tilt it downwards like that, and then kind of like this again. So that's what you should have for that drawing there, and that should correspond with A, answer option A. Now, um, with that out of the way, we can move on to problem four. Um, so, this is spherical mirrors and images. It says this picture shows a four centimeter tall object and its image created by a thin spherical mirror located in the dotted box, right? And we want to calculate the image distance for part A. So, we have height of the object is four centimeters. Um, we can see that the object distance DO is 60 centimeters, right? And the image height is two centimeters, right? And they want us to figure out the image distance. How do you guys think we can relate object distance and image distance to object height and image height? Magnification, magnification right? So magnification that'll be equal to um, negative of the image distance divided by 
the object distance, right? So magnification, negative di over dl, right? And that's what we're trying to figure out here, which is the, um, the image distance, right? So do, do is um, that 60 centimeters, right? And then di is what we're trying to figure out. Now, magnification, there's a second part of the equation, right? Or second equation that we could use. So we don't know what di is. Mm. That's what we're trying to figure out. But how can we figure out the magnification as well? Mm. Exactly. Mm. Yep. So we have is the height of the image, right? Height of the image over height of the object, if I'm not mistaken. And then, yeah, so the height of the image is 2 centimeters. And then height of the object is four centimeters, so that's a magnification of 0.5, which makes sense because that image is smaller than the object, so it should be magnified downwards, or smaller, basically, mm -hmm. right? So um, this is 0.5, so 0.5 is equal to negative di over do, which is 60 centimeters, right? And then that gives us a di of negative 30 um, centimeters there, right? And so what do you know about image distances that are negative? They're virtual, exactly, right? So those are virtual images. Now, for part B, um, it says calculate the focal length of the mirror. Specify if this is a concave or a convex mirror. So I have 1 over f. This is the, um, the lens maker equation here, right? Um, or is lens maker equation for the lenses stuff, but yeah. Um, so 1 over our focal length divided by, or is equal to 1 over our image distance plus 1 over our object distance, right? So we know this is 1 over negative 30 plus 1 over positive 60, right? And then um, we can essentially just calculate what that is for 1 over f, right? So um, that'll just be, what is it? So make your denominator. It's 120. Exactly, right? So um, negative 2 over 60 here plus 1 over 60. So this should be um, negative 1 over 60 and that's your 1 over f right so if that's your 1 over f then your f is essentially just negative 60 centimeters right and that would be um what would that indicate is that a concave or a convex mirror in this case convex right um, the reason is because I it think it's virtual. exactly it's a virtual image that was produced and you have this negative focal length um, anytime usually when you see like a negative uh, value it'll be like virtual images it'll be diverging lenses mm -hmm. it'll be convex mirrors right concave so would concave would be positive yeah um, mm -hmm. exactly yeah so concave would be producing like real images um, It'll be converging lenses, stuff like that, right? So anytime you see negative stuff, it's usually going to be like with diverging lenses, convex mirrors. Um, you'll have like negative focal lengths and whatnot. But yeah, that'll indicate that this is a convex mirror. Um, and it's really important, I think, to go back and maybe look at the readings and stuff to um, remember this stuff because I'm not sure if it's like on the equation sheet because some, some of the stuff is like I know for, especially when you get to like the nuclear uh, type problems, you'll see that they'll give you what alpha decay is and what beta decay is and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm definitely gonna put some stuff. yeah, I would like make sure to like have that like in your memory and then like write it down on the equation seat so you don't like forget it like midway during the exam. But yeah, um, now we have problem five, right? So problem five is lenses, images, and magnification. So the lens creates a virtual upright image at a distance of 10 centimeters. Um, so this image distance is 10 centimeters, but is it positive 10 or negative 10? Negative 10. Negative 10, because it's, it's virtual, exactly, right? So negative 10 centimeters right here for the virtual image. And it says it's three times smaller than the real object. Would that be talking about its height or its distance? So that would be the height, right? So three times smaller than the real object, it would be the height, right? And then what would that indicate about something like the magnification then, if it's three times smaller? So remember the height of the image, right, divided by the height of the object is our magnification. Mm -hmm. And if they said the image is three times as small as the real object. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a weird way to say it, but like three times as smaller. 
So. Yeah. Like one third. Yeah, exactly, one third. So, like, if you said your um, image height was a centimeter tall, right? Mm -hmm. Then the object height would be three centimeters tall because that would, the object would be three times as big as the image, mm -hmm. or in other words, the image is three times as small as the object, basically, right? So this is kind of using the same relationship that we had for the previous problem to figure out something like the object distance, right? So we know that magnification is also equal to negative times our image dis or negative of the image distance divided by our object distance. And then that we know is equal to one third. And we know that the image distance just so happens to be that negative 10 centimeters. So don't just like throw in the negative 10 and just have that as your answer or as your DI, right? Um, remember that there's an extra negative sign. So it's like negative of negative 10. So that actually makes it positive here. Um, so that's 10 centimeters here divided by our object distance and that's equal to one third, right? And so that means that our object distance is 30 centimeters in this case, right? And so if you think about it, like this kind of all makes sense here because you have a positive magnification, right? So you know that you have, um, what do I want to say? Yeah. Yeah. Like yep. So with a positive magnification, you should have a. That means like you have an upright image and not mm -hmm. an inverted image, right? Because that checks out because it says the image was upright and not inverted. Mm -hmm. So, like if you were to throw in a, like instead of saying like negative of negative ten centimeters, you just throw in negative ten mm -hmm. and you get a negative magnification. Well, that doesn't add up because that would indicate an inverted image when we know that it's an upright image. So that's also kind of like a sanity check just to make sure that you're doing the problem correctly. But yeah, so our, our object distance is 30 centimeters and then we have the focal length. So this is just a lot of repetitive stuff at this point, right? So it's just the same equations that we're using, um, same concepts and stuff. So we're gonna use the lens maker equation again, which is one over the focal length and that's equal to one over the object distance plus one over the image distance. We know the object distance is 30 centimeters now, and the image distance was that negative 10 centimeters, right? And then that gives us a, like one over focal length, um, that should be what? So this is negative three, so negative two over 30, basically, for our one over F, right? Mm -hmm. And that just means our focal length should be negative 15 centimeters. And what would that indicate about the type of lens that we're looking at here? Is this a converging or a diverging lens in this case? They would ask you. Diverging, right? Because like we said, if it's, if we're talking about like negative values and stuff, yeah. then we're talking about like virtual images. We're looking at like negative focal lengths. We're looking at um, diverging lenses because you're producing like virtual yeah. images and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So usually when you see like a negative focal length, um, a negative image distance, you're looking at like convex mirrors, diverging lenses, because those will produce um, a virtual image. But sometimes with a concave mirror and with converging lenses, depending on the object's location, you might get a virtual image, um, but your focal length is still positive. Like the focal length is constant for that. Your focal length is positive for concave mirrors and for um, converging lenses. But for your um, image like distances and stuff, you could get a negative image distance because could, you could get a virtual image with a concave mirror or a converging lens. If the, and I think this is the only scenario where you would have this, if the object is located between the focal point and the mirror or the lens, right? So if it's like they have like the little F here for your focal point and then here's your mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, this is convex mirror. So let me redraw that as a concave mirror. So if you're, um, here's like your vertex of your concave mirror, right? If you have the object lo located somewhere in between the focal point and the mirror, the mm -hmm. concave mirror, that'll produce a virtual image. Same thing is, is if you have a um, converging lens. So if you have a converging lens like this, it's a poor drawing of a converging lens, but if you have your focal length or a focal point like that, and you have the object here, then if your focal point 
or if your object is between the focal point and the converging lens, then that will result in a virtual image as well. Do you guys need me to write that on the board too? Mm -hmm. Like just to confirm that, Matthew, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, oh no, I, I'm pretty interested in that. Okay, awesome, awesome. Gotcha. Um, so that's five. Now we're moving on to six, right? So problem six is carbon dating. A fossil has a carbon-14 content with a half-life of 5,730 years. Mm -hmm. um, that is only one sixteenth that of a present-day specimen, right? So half-life... T one half is yeah. Go ahead. For problems like these, mm -hmm. when finding the uh, tella, the T, the big T, will we have to convert our half life into seconds, or can we just keep it as as is? Um, so you would do seconds if you were doing like if you're looking at like activity, right? So like your R value, like if you're doing activity, then that is in measurement, or like the units would be like decay per second usually. That's the SI unit for it. But for this, um, you can keep it in years. Oh, so for the part B, then we'll need to convert this into seconds. Yeah, so that, in that case, you would have to like look at things in seconds because the, um, the Becquerel unit, the BQ, that is in, um, like the denominator units are like in seconds. Um, so, yeah. But for the other like half-life stuff, I'm pretty sure you can just use like whatever units that they have for you. So like if you're, um, looking at the age of a fossil, right, like this case, and they're giving you the half-life is like 5,000 years or something like that, then whatever you end up calculating, right, you can just keep it in the original unit that they gave you. You don't have to like convert to like seconds because that's just unnecessary at that point. Um, but yeah, for the activity stuff, um, then you actually have to convert to seconds because in that case, the unit has to match up, like your SI units have to match up with one another. Because it's like same, same with doing, um, like if you're doing the... Uh, What's it called? Like if you're just doing like your magnetic field calculations, right? You can't just like plug in like centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make sure that you plug in meters, right? Because you have to have your SI units all add up to one another. So yeah, in this case, you just keep the years. But for part B, for the um, activity, you would actually have to um, convert things to seconds because it's in the units are like decay per second or something like that. But for calculating the age of the fossil, right, we have um, the half-life is 5,730 years, right? And then they said it, that's 1 16th of a present-day specimen, right? So essentially, like, our current carbon-14 content would be 1 16th of the original, right? So our equation for the half-life um, stuff is going to be that n null t right so t is like after a certain period of time so that's the amount that you have left after a certain period of time and that's equal to the original amount right and then multiplied by one half and then raised to the power of the time that we're looking at right um and then divided by the half life right so that's your exponent here is t over um t one half t one half is your half life and then t is just like the age of the um, specimen or the fossil in this case, right? So T is kind of what we're looking for in this case. So if we were to set this up, you might think, well, all right, I have this original amount, but I'm not sure what it is, right? They don't give us an original amount. They don't tell us like how much of the specimen there is, but we know that there's 1 16th of the specimen left mm -hmm. after that many years, right? Um, and so you can kind of write this to cancel out that variable. Like you, you can write the equation to cancel out that um, the amount of the specimen there, right? So, or amount of the nuclei. So you have, you can write on the left-hand side, like 1 16th N O, right? Because that'll just be the amount that's left over. And then on the right-hand side, you obviously just have your N O still, and the N O's will cancel out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you can just have your 1 half, and then raised to the power of T over T one half and T one half, like we said, is going to be that five thousand seven hundred and thirty years because that's our half life. T over five five thousand seven hundred and thirty, right? Now, um, let's see here. So this cancels out with that, so we're left with one sixteenth is equal to one half raised to that power. 
right? Um, what did I want to do here? So we can just take the natural log of both sides, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have like. <coughs> If we want to solve for for t, uh, actually, you don't have to. You can really easily look at this and figure it out. So if you have one over sixteen, mm -hmm. right, then one half raised to something like that something is the exponent that we're looking for, like this exponent here. Mm -hmm. Whatever we raise one half to, we have to get one sixteenth, right? Yeah. So Square two times two times two times two, two to the fourth is going to be sixteen, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we know then the exponent. This exponent is going to be equal to four. So t over five thousand seven hundred and thirty is equal to four, right? And then we can just solve for t at that point. That'll give us the the age of the fossil. Mm -hmm. um, and I have here it's like twenty two thousand nine hundred twenty years. I'm not sure if that's one hundred percent right, but yeah, around like 20 something thousand years. But yeah, so do you mind if I grab your calculator here as well just to kind of like check something real quick? So if we had, let's see here. Okay. Yeah, you would take the natural log of, of both sides to figure it out. I was just double checking. Um, so yeah, if you take like natural log of 1 16th, and the natural log of this whole thing, like 1 half raised to the power of t over 5,730, well, based on natural log properties, right, mm -hmm. we know that the exponent can just be pulled out of yeah. the equation, right? So you can just have t over 5,730, and then multiply by ln 1 half, right? And then this is ln 1 16th, and then you can just divide the ln over, right? Whatever ln 1 half is, divide that over by ln um, 1 16th. And then... Yeah, yeah. So usually you do that. But th in this case, right, we, it's helpful to, like, figure out what the exponent value is in mm -hmm. the case that you don't have such an easy value that you can figure out just by looking at the exponent and stuff. So if they give you, like, instead of... Well, they won't give you, like, one third, obviously, because we're talking about half-lives, but... Mm -hmm. Let's say they gave you like, I don't know, one fifth, is, one fifth of the sample is left or something like that, right? That's a little harder to figure out, obviously. So in that case, you'd have to do some of the like the natural log stuff to figure it out. But in that case, you just solve for t. And I think once you do that, you should get like four on the left-hand side here. And that's equal to t over um, 5,730. And then you can just solve for that. So the same thing. But um, yeah. And then we have part b now. Right. Wait, what was the answer you gave for part A? For part A, I got like 22,920 years. I got 22,876. Um, 877 not too far off. It's like <laughs> a good 50 years. <laughs> um, probably maybe just like a rounding error or something like that. Let me take a look. Yeah, so that'll come with like you need these this type of equation, that's still right and stuff. It's just that um, that's more like they rounded that off as opposed to like going by like a more accurate or like more definite value. So you might be just like a tad bit off, but you should be able to still get like a very close answer. So okay. as long as you have the work correct, like that's the most important thing. But you're definitely using the right equation. It's because there's like three or four different equations that you can use um, for this because they'll approximate it. Um, but yeah. So just make sure that you use the, um, just like the regular like half-life equation, right? I just wanna double check that. Mm -hmm. So, cause there's like, I'm trying to pull it up here. So let's see here. Um, Yeah, so use the um, NOE to the negative T over tau, right? That's the one you use, Matthew, right? Negative T over 
yeah. Yeah, that's the one you used? Okay, yeah. That, that one's fine as well. Um, yeah, because like LN2 is like that uh, 0 0.0625 or something like that, right? So, yeah, if you use that one, that's fine too. It's just that um, I think it would probably be better to use the first one just to like be as accurate as you can. But that's fine. Anyway. Um, yeah, so part B now, they're asking for, what is it? Uh, activity, right? So activity in Becquerel's. So it says the fossil contains five times 10 to the 11th carbon 14 atoms, right? Um, we wanna calculate its activity now, right? So activity, the equation for activity is RT, right? And then that's equal to NT over tau, right? Um, and that's basically just saying like, if you wanted to like go ahead and expand that equation out um, or use one of the other equations, you're looking at like, because based on how like you rewrite tau, you're looking at um, <coughs> ln2 times nt over the half-life, or you could also write it out as 0.693 or like, yeah, 0.693 times nt and then divided by half-life as well, right? Uh, oops, I wrote the slash too early. Half-life, right? So LN2 LN is that 0.693. So it's just that I think they're just expanding that tau definition and then taking that and kind of plugging things in because tau is equal to the half-life divided by LN2. So that's where they're getting this LN2 stuff here. But yeah, if you use like any one of these equations like and you just kind of expand things out, you should be fine. But to figure out then the activity, which is our R, we just take like that 0.693 and then multiply by the, um, uh, what's it called? The atoms, I don't know why I blanked there. The number of atoms that we have here. So five times 10 to the 11th, right? And then divided by the half-life here, which is what? Uh, that was the 5,730 years. Right, and then that should give us the um, the activity in Becquerel's. Ah, hold up, hmm. hold up, hold up, hold up. So, made a mistake here, I think, because this should be in seconds, right? Because we're dealing with the activity, which should be in decay per second. So, to make sure that that's the case, then we have to like convert from years to seconds so um <clears throat> but yeah so let's see here <clears throat> man i think it was like i remember like having to memorize it because it's such a common like thing that we had to do for the exam i want to say the number of seconds in the year is like 3.15 times 10 to the 7 yeah that <laughs> all right cool and i still remember it um so it would be like three point, yeah, three point one five <clears throat> times ten to the seventh seconds in a year, and we're talking about like five thousand seven hundred thirty years, basically, right? So yeah, and I think that should get you the answer here. And let me double check my work to make sure that I'm not doing anything incorrectly. Um. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I just want to double check and make sure that the work is right. 0.693 times 5 times 10 to the 11th, and then divided by 5,730 times 3.15 times 10 to the 7th. Yep, and that gives you 1.9 Becquerels. I just wanted to confirm that that was the case. But I think. Maybe, <coughs> hold up, yeah. Um, I wanna see if there's like a way around like having to calculate this in seconds or like, yeah, let me see here. Nah, I don't think so. Yeah, you definitely have to like be able to like convert this to seconds. Um, is it on the equation sheet by any chance? Do they have like the number of seconds in a year? I think that it sounds like such a ridiculous thing to 
to know or to have, but yeah, I don't think they do. I would highly recommend knowing how many <laughs> seconds there are in a year. Um, because so hard. I, otherwise, like you're gonna be sat there like you to do seven like, days a week, seven days a week, like. <laughs> And then times 24, times 60, times it's what? Exactly. Like, you see, exactly. Yeah. Like, then you're still like. Okay, but better than the seven days, bro. Yeah. Seven, <laughs> seven days, days in a year. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you definitely have to make sure that you're working in seconds here. Otherwise, you're going to get an answer that's a little bit off. A lot of bit off, actually, not a little bit. Um, but, yeah, that's how to, to look at things in that sense. And those are the types of equations that you want to use for this activity stuff. Just make sure that you're doing things in decay per second. <clears throat> Man, I need like a sip of water here in a sec. But that concludes the, um, the short problems. And so we can probably just go ahead and move to the longer problems now. Um, <clears throat> what I want to say. So now we're on the magnetic fields stuff. So um for magnetic fields it says a particle with charge positive 2e moves through a magnetic field as indicated in the figure with a speed of 200 meters per second right so we have speed our v is 200 meters per second um and then charge is positive 2e right no that's fine no you can i will be back Okay, yeah, cool. cool. No worries. Um, but yeah, so we have the charge is 2e and the speed is 200 meters per second. Yep, exactly. Use the right hand rule. Mm -hmm. So for the right hand rule, right, we have thumb pointing in the direction of the particle, right? So it kind of goes like this. That's our thumb. And then you have your index finger pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So it's upwards, right? that right and then what should that mean for our force well i would do it i would do it like this i would um exactly out of the page yep so if you have your thumb pointing up into the right index finger for magnetic field pointing up up the page and then your middle finger should be perpendicular to all of those, and that should be pointing out of the page. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so that is our direction for the magnetic force. So in that go, that's part A right then and there. So in direction of the magnetic force should just be out of the page based on the right-hand rule. So these are like pretty like easy points to kind of rack up. Like that's two points right there for knowing how to like position your fingers and like contort your hand in a special way to like figure out what the magnetic force in the field is. Um, but that's our direction. Now we have our part B here is asking for the magnitude of the magnetic field. So it says the magnetic force on the particle is 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16 Newtons, right? So magnetic force um, is your FB and that's 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16 Newtons. Would yep. Be equal to the positive two electrons, right? Yep, exactly. So positive two <laughs> times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, that would give us the charge of the particle here, right? And then now we're just looking at what is B essentially, right? So we know that to calculate, um, uh, what's it called? The magnetic force. We know that that's equal to QVB. So it's the magnitude of the charge of the particle times the um, perpendicular component of the velocity and then times the magnitude of the magnetic field, right? So we have the magnitude of the charge, that's two times the uh, charge of an electron. So that's two times the 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, times our perpendicular component of the velocity, that was the uh, 200 meters per second. But here's the thing, so 200 meters per second that's just the regular velocity of the particle, but keep in mind that they're asking for the perpendicular component, right? So for the perpendicular component, I'm gonna draw this on the board first and then I'll draw it on my iPad here in a sec. But you have moving 200 meters per second like this, right? And you know that the magnetic field is pointing upwards like that, right? So, 
guys want to take a look at the board real quick? So we have oh, right. magnetic field, so right? Because for the equation, uh, mm -hmm. force is equal to charge times velocity times magnetic field. We would also have sometimes in rare occasions adding time sign. Exactly, okay. right. So in this case, what do they have the angle as? 60 degrees, right? So we want the um, perpendicular component of the velocity. So if you have your magnetic field pointing upwards, what would be perpendicular to it would be the velocity this way. So this is your perpendicular component of the velocity, right? So we want the like the x axis, the x component of the velocity. So this is your velocity. Here's the y component, like vy. Essentially, we want like vx, basically, right? That's the idea here. And so to get that vx or that perpendicular component, we just take 200 meters per second and then multiply by cosine 60 degrees, right? To get that x component. Now, if they were to have a magnetic field that's like instead of up and down, right? If you have it left to right, I would say the magnetic field looks like this, right? Um, and your, I don't know, let's say your particle is moving this way again, right? Well, we want the perpendicular component once again, right? So, are we looking for Vx or Vy in this case? Vy, exactly, because that'll be perpendicular to the magnetic field. So let's say this is 200 meters per second again, and this is your 60 degrees, and you do 200 sine 60 to get this component, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is pointing left to right. So whenever you have a particle kind of moving at an angle like that, make sure to have or include the angle in your equation. So you can't just multiply by 200, you have to multiply in this case by 200 times cosine 60. So, yeah, go ahead. Wait, cosine 16, not yeah. sine 60? Yeah, cosine 60 in this case, because they're looking for the perpendicular component of the velocity. So if your magnetic field is pointing upwards like this, we want the perpendicular component. So we want like the x component, basically, of the velocity. All oh, right, because yep. velocity is moving. Exactly. Yeah. So, oh, all right. Mm -hmm. all right. So we have the 200 times cosine 60 in this case. That's our velocity. So it would just be either, like, either sine or theta, not tan? No, 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 no. We wouldn't do tangent at all in this case. Tangent would just be like, I think tangent would be beneficial to figure out like the angle itself if they were to ask you for that. Um, but yeah, it would just be cosine 60 in this case to get that horizontal component or the component that's perpendicular in this case to the magnetic field. So 200 times cosine 60 and then you multiply it by the um, uh, magnetic field. And so really the magnetic field is what we're looking for. So we can essentially just kind of like isolate the variable. So we have 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16 newtons on the left. Um, that's equal to two times the charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs for a single like electron or a proton. Um, and then multiplied by the perpendicular component of the velocity and then multiplied by the magnetic field. So if we divide everything over, we should be able to get the magnetic field. And let me write that on the board for you guys to see here as well. So they had, you know, that the force, magnetic force is equal to Q, V, V, we have the absolute value of the magnitude of the charge, and we have the magnitude of the field, right? So the charge was two times the charge of the electron, so two times 1.6 times the negative 19 coulombs, right? And the V perpendicular, let me kind of erase this stuff here real quick. And the units of our magnetic field, the uh, V would be T, right? Uh, the units? The units for magnetic field? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there would be Teslas. So, you have that 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? And then multiply by the perpendicular component of the velocity, which is that 200 meters per second times cosine 60, right? And then the magnetic uh, field is what we're kind of looking for. And we know that the magnetic force was, what again, was 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16. So 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16 newtons, and then we can just kind of like divide all that over and then solve for v. Right? <coughs> so that should give us our magnetic field. And let me double check that. Um, so we have 1.28 times 10 to the negative 16, and then divided by 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and then times 200 cosine 60 
Um, and that should give us four Teslas. So we should get four Teslas for our magnetic field here, right? <clears throat> now, part C is saying the field is generated by a solenoid. So remember, a solenoid is going to be a current carrying wire that has like just a bunch of loops together. So you either have like a straight current carrying wire, you might have like a circular loop, or you might have that solenoid, which is like a bunch of circular loops together, right? So it says the field is generated by a solenoid with a length of 50 centimeters and 1,000 turns. So 1,000 turns is like saying like 1,000 circular loops, basically. Um, and so they want you to calculate the current generating the field. So there's a specific equation to figure out the like magnetic field of the solenoid. So in this case, we already have the magnetic field. We know it's four Teslas. But we know that the magnetic field for a solenoid is dependent on a couple different factors. Number one, obviously, like the current, which is trying, which is what we're trying to figure out. But we're also, it's also dependent on the um, number of turns and the length of the solenoid itself. So there should be an equation that is like this, where you have the permittivity constant, like mu zero, and then um, times your number of turns, times your current, and then divided by your length of the solenoid, right? And so if we do all of that, we know that you have um, your permittivity constant, I believe that should be four pi times 10 to the negative seven. Number of turns is a thousand turns. Um, and then let's see here, what else? I is what we're looking for, our current, and then divided by the length, which is 50 centimeters. Obviously we want, we want things in SI units, so 50 centimeters would be 0.5 meters instead. Right, and then um, we have our magnetic field from before, which is that four Teslas. So if we multiply everything over and divide things over, we should be able to get our current. Um, and let me double check that this is all right here. So four times 0.5, um, and then divided by the four pi times 10 to the negative seven, which is our permittivity constant here, and then multiply by a thousand. So, yep, we should get like somewhere close to 1.59 um, times 10 to the third, basically, which is like, 1590, I think, is what is what I got around that value. Um, and that's amps. Obviously, that's your current. And let me write that on the board here real quick so you guys can see that. So once again, like a solar noise, just kind of like a bunch of loops like that, right? And the magnetic field equation for it is that permittivity constant times the number of turns times your current and then divided by the length, right? So this was 1,000 turns, right? This is what we're trying to figure out. This is our current. Um, this is the length of the solenoid itself, right? Um, and then magnetic field up, so they gave us that, or we figured it out from before, which is the four Teslas, right? So you just multiply over your length, divide over your permittivity constant, and the number of turns that helps figure out your current. Um, but yeah, so. Um, but yeah, that, th those are the three scenarios, the types of like current carrying wires that you're going to encounter. You're either going to encounter a straight current carrying wire or a solenoid or a circular loop. Um, but yeah. Now, the last part of this problem is, I think it's just a right-hand rule again. So it says the picture on the right um, shows a front view of the solenoid with the magnetic field pointing into the page. Does the current flow clockwise or counterclockwise through the solenoid? So this is part D. Yeah, go ahead. For this problem, will we be using like a kind of right hand rule? We know we have current, we have our force, we have our field. So I'm just trying to remember how we exactly use this in order to determine if it's like mm -hmm. moving clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah. So this, remember, there's two right hand rules, right? There's the first one, which is like for current carrying wires, and then there's the other one, which is like this. This is for like figuring out like the direction of a particle. Um, looking at like magnetic force, stuff like that, right? So if you have the first right hand rule that is um, trying to figure out for a current carrying wire, so that'll be your thumb, and then your fingers wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field. So it'll either be like into the page or out of the page and stuff like that. So I wish I had like, I think my old uh, physics teacher in high school, she used like a hula hoop to like show this because it's just so nice to like wrap your fingers around and just see what's going on. But basically, right, if you look at that circle there, then what you see, obviously one thing to remember too is that X's means into the page, and like if you have dots, that means out of the page, right? Um, that's one notation that you have to keep in mind as well. 
But since we have into the page like this, it means that wherever you're handling, like you're holding this, like, like I said, if it's just a, um, a hula hoop, then wherever you're kind of holding or putting your fingers around, your fingers should kind of like wrap inwards into the hula hoop or into the circle, right? So the idea is that we want, like, wherever our thumb is pointing in, which is the direction of the current, right? We want it to where our fingers kind of wrap always inside, right? So if I'm moving downwards like this, I should be wrapping in like this. If I'm moving like to the left like that, I should be wrapping in like this, right? So like that, like this, I'm going up here, right? I don't know if you can see that, but like, essentially if I'm moving to the right at the top, my fingers should be wrapping like downwards and into the center of the circle, right? Okay, so basically clockwise? Clockwise, exactly. Right? So if you do that, you should see that, okay, well if I move this way, clockwise, then my hand perfectly wraps towards the center of the circle into the page at every single point. Now, if I try to do it counterclockwise, right, where I'm moving this way, right, then I can see that if I wrap my fingers around, right, mm -hmm. uh, do you mind if I use your water bottle? Oh, yeah. Okay. So if I kind of wrap my fingers around this way, let's say this is the center of the circle here, if I wrap it around like this, I can see that it's actually coming out of the page. So it's like that, right? As opposed to, this is obviously if I'm moving counterclockwise. But if I'm moving clockwise like this, right, I can see that it's into the page. That's the center of the Does that make sense? Do you see that? Yeah, it's very like, it's all kind of visual. Yeah. Does that help clear it up a little bit more? Okay. Um, I don't know if there's. Let me see. I'll just like maybe grab uh, a wire that I have or something and like maybe tie it into a circle. I don't know. So it'll move inwards depending on where you're looking at. So if I'm going counterclockwise, it's inwards, but outside of the circle. So like here, you're going inwards, but when you wrap it around, it comes outside of the page. Oh, so it's looking inside So it's looking for inside of the circle, exactly. Yep. So you always have like one area will be into the page, one area will be out of the page, but it's just dependent on where they're asking you to look. So since they're looking at inside the circle, if I were moving counterclockwise, right? to the right of the circle, which is outside, I'd be into the page, but by the time I come and wrap around my fingers, it's out of the page. So by the time you get there, it's out of the page. So, um, I don't know if it's, if you're good, I don't have to like tie this into it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and then like I said, for the, um, the other right hand rule, that's only if you're like looking for the motion of the particle and stuff. So thumb is the movement of the particle, index fingers if you're into or out of the page, and then your middle finger would just be the um, magnetic force, right? Now, I think it's probably best to like do a lot of practice with that because personally, like I, when I first took physics in high school, like, okay, so here, here's like my requirement, I guess, for doing this. Either you do like a lot of practice or you like play an instrument or something where like your fingers are super like flexible and whatnot because otherwise it gets very straining and it hurts a lot. Like I remember in high school, like, my fingers and my hands would just like cramp up all the time when I was doing this chapter. But um, I play a lot of piano, so like my fingers are like all spread out and very flexible. So um, yeah, like if you just do a lot of this stuff to where you can like fix your fingers into like this perpendicular position for all three, um, I think that's probably the best thing you can do. Otherwise you're gonna be stuck in the exam just kind of like doing a whole bunch of this and like it's just gonna be very hard to do. Um, and another trick too, especially if you're dealing with negative particles. So remember like the right hand rule is also primarily based on a positive particle that we're looking at. Now, if they gave you a negative particle or maybe they're asking you like if it's a negative, if it's a negative particle, right? If they're asking like, whether the particle is positive or negative, then the way I like to do it, because sometimes like you'll get a scenario that's like out of the page and like at an angle or something. So it's like really hard to like do. So you could, for a negative particle, you could technically use your left hand um, I wouldn't like 100% advise it because it might like get confusing, but these two, like your thumb, your index finger, those will stay constant. But if you're dealing with a negative particle, whatever direction the force points in with your left hand is the force that, like that's the direction of the, um, for the negative particle, right? So we can kind of like test that out real quick. If we move back to that um, problem, uh, problem one, right? Where they had the particle 
um, moving to the to the left, right? So they had, in this case, they at the end they were asking if it was positive or negative, right? So the idea is that you want your force to point in the direction of the centripetal force. So we want to maintain that circular motion, right, for problem one. So you had the particle moving to the left, right? So this is kind of counterclockwise, and your uh, magnetic field was into the page. So your middle finger just points downwards naturally. So we know that this is a positive particle because that magnetic force has to align with the center so you can maintain that circle, basically. Now, if you were moving to the right, if you were moving to the right, then thumb points to the right, magnetic field inwards, then your force is upwards, right? And so that would indicate that this particle is not a positive particle, it has to be a negative, right? And so basically, now that they're asking, let, let's say they, they tell you that it's a negative particle, now they're asking, okay, well, how does the magnetic force point? Let's say you don't know or you don't understand this whole centripetal force thing, so you're just going by the right-hand rule. Well, you know that the right-hand rule is based on positive, so if you see an upwards force in that case, it would be downwards, actually, for, for the negative. Now, if we were to test it out, with, like I said, with the, with the left hand, you're moving to the right, magnetic field inwards, you see your magnetic force is pointing downwards like that. So you could use your left hand if you want to, just for negative particles only. Um, but I think it's also just to kind of keep it all kind of together and all in the same context. It'd probably just be better to stick with the right hand. And whenever you have a negative particle, just flip whatever force you see. So if the force is pointing to the left and you know it's a negative particle, then the force is actually pointing to the right. So. Um, but yeah, so this was, we said this was clockwise, right, for part D. Because, um, yeah, so if we were moving clockwise, then our fingers will kind of wrap around naturally into the center of the circle, into the page like that, which is what we want. And remember, X's are into the page, and circles, like dots, will be out of the page. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, real quick, just before I head up, did mm -hmm. I have a class? Yeah, no worries. So, yeah, yeah, so now for your oil now, whatever angle you got for like your oil um, should be, that's a little bit so I was back to the um, so. Yes, 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 yes. So you're, you use like a Z rule for the geometry, right? So like your angle of incidence should be that 37.66. So the angle will be the same. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, great question. I got Yep, no worries. But I'll be back later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so now we can probably move on to problem eight, which is refraction through oil and water. Right, so let me write problem eight out here real quick. So fraction through oil and water, it says a film of oil floats on a pool of water where you have the ref uh, index of refraction of the water is 1.33, right? So index of refraction of water is 1.33 and then light traveling in air, right? The index of refraction of air is just 1.00, right? So it's refracted at the air oil interface under an angle of 37.6 degrees, right? So that tells us that the refracted angle has an angle of 37.6 degrees. The incident angle, right, which is like basically the incident ray, like how it's hitting the surface initially. So we're going from air to oil. That incident angle, the incident ray is at 60 degrees. When it gets refracted by the um, oil interface, right, then it kind of moves into the, um, um, 37.6 degree angle, right? So 37.6 degrees is our angle for the oil interface. 60 degrees is our angle for the air interface. So if they're asking now for part A, the refractive index of the oil layer, they're asking for like N oil basically, right? Um, you have N air, you have N water, right? Really what we're going to be dealing with here is the difference between N air and N, N oil. So what equation or like what law do you think kind of applies here with the refractive index stuff? Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? So N1 sine theta 1, N2 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. So that's Snell's law. Um, so use Snell's law for this, right? So that's 
n1 sine theta 1, right, is equal to n2 sine theta 2, right? So in this case, n1 would be the first, like, index of refraction, which is air. Um, sine theta 1 would be that uh, angle of incidence, that 60 degrees, right, how the ray is coming in, hitting the surface initially. And then theta 2 would be the angle that's of the refracted angle, how it gets refracted, that 37.6 degrees. And then n2 would be the index of refraction of the oil, basically, which is exactly what we're trying to figure out. So you can kind of simplify this equation down to just n1 sine theta 1, right? And then divided by sine theta 2, and that gives you n2, basically, right? And if you want to rewrite this as like n air sine theta air is equal to n oil sine theta oil, I think that'd be better as well. Um, maybe that'll help to just kind of like visualize this a little bit better. So with that being said, we have n air is obviously just one and then times sine 60 degrees and then um, sine theta two or our like sine theta oil um, is going to be that sine 37.6 degrees, right? Because that's the angle that's being refracted there or that, um, what's it called? The uh, refracted ray will have that angle 37.6 degrees, right? So um, I keep writing this as like, a big number, 37.6 degrees, there we go. And then once you do that, you should be able to get your new index of refraction, right, for, for oil. Um, and I believe that should be uh, around 1.42, let me double check that. So sine 60 divided by sine 37.6, yep, 1.42. And now um, for part B, once we have this index of refraction of the oil, they're asking us now for the refracted angle in the water layer, right? So we know the index of refraction of oil, we know the index of refraction of water. So this is just gonna be using Snell's law again, a second time just to figure things out for the angle of water, right? So the angle, like the, the um, refracted angle in the oil, that was 37.6 degrees. That also happens to be the angle of incidence for this second scenario. So you got refracted to 37.6 degrees, but now you're also hitting the water at 37.6 degrees as well. And you can kind of see that where they have in the image, like um, basically the ray kind of looks like this and you have, uh, I'll, I'll draw it up on the board here in a sec. So you came in with what? This was 37.6 degrees here. And then like based on geometric rules, you know that this angle of incidence is also 37.6 degrees, which is because you have parallel lines and kind of this Z shape shows you that you have to have um, the angles the same there. So our angle that's refracted with the oil is also our angle of incidence for the second scenario. So here on the board here, right, we kind of have the ray, um, let me draw that. So we have the ray coming down like this, right? Um, this was refracted to 37.6 degrees, and now it's getting like refracted even more but this is like this oil up here, and this is air up there, and this is water down here, right? So now that we're hitting this water surface, this angle should be equal to this angle. Because there are two parallel lines, you have this like Z shape, and so this should be 37.6 degrees, and that's your angle of incidence for the second scenario, basically. Right? Um, so like we do N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two again, but now our N1 is gonna be N oil, sine theta one will be sine 37.6 degrees instead. So N oil, sine theta oil is equal to N water, sine theta water, right? And we're looking for theta water basically, which is the refractive angle of the water layer. So theta water is equal to N oil, sine theta oil divided by N water. And so N oil in this case, they told us, um, or we figured it out, that was 1.42 and then times sine theta oil. So the angle here is going to be that 37.6 degrees again. And then divided by the refractive index of the water, right? So that's 1.33. <clears throat> and then if we do that, we should be able to get theta water, or hold up, almost forgot. So this is sine theta water on both sides. So whatever we get here, um, we should actually take the inverse sine of it so let's say like sine theta water, let me solve that out here real quick. So sine theta water is 
1.42 times sine 37.6 degrees divided by 1.33. Sine theta water is equal to 0 0.65. So inverse sine of sine theta water gives us theta water, right? Um, and inverse sine of 0.65, right? If we just take the inverse sine of that, that should give us 40.6 degrees as the angle, the refracted angle of the water. Does that make sense? Um, now the final part is asking for the critical angle um, for the total internal reflection. So for the critical angle stuff, there's a very just basic equation that you have to use for this to figure out the critical angle. Um, and that is also just kind of based on um, Snell's law. So let me double check the equation sheet just to make sure that I have it correctly here. And I believe it's like sine theta of N2 of over N1, inverse sine of N2 over N1, yeah. So for part C, where we're doing the critical angle, you can find the critical angle just by doing inverse sine of N2 over N1. N2 being the second um, like material that you're going into and N1 being the initial material. So between the oil and the water interface, oil is like your N1 and then water is your N2 because N2 would just be the second material that you're going through, which is the water here. So you can just simply do uh, inverse sine of the um, quotient of the two materials. So N oil was 1.42 and then N water was um, 1.33. So if you just take the inverse sine of that you should be able to get your critical angle here. So let me double check. It's inverse sine 1.42 divided by 1.33, right? Um, and we get an error for some reason. Let me see here, 1.42 1.33. I don't see anything wrong with that, I don't think. Mm, hold up. Yeah, N water should be N2. Hmm. Let's see here. So N2 should our should be our second material and N1 should be our first. But I think just because the way the sine function works, that'll inherently give you an error in the calculator. If you reverse the two, that should be all right. You should get 69.5 degrees that way. But that, I'm wondering, hmm. That's odd. Hmm. That's very weird. Well, I think probably like a better way to go about it, if the equation is kind of like a little iffy, like if it gives you an error, the foolproof way to do it is you can just kind of like use Snell's law. So if you have that N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two again, right? Um, and then you want to basically have the angle like because basically when you have total internal reflection like that then that ray is completely reflected it doesn't actually go through the water interface right so um i'm trying to think yeah so the maximum angle at that point would just be, yeah, okay, okay, let me, let me write this out. So when you are looking at the water interface, you observe the critical angle pretty much when the refracted angle of like the second surface is going to be 90 degrees. So it would kind of look like, let me draw it on the board here in a sec, but it would look like this where you have oil coming down and then you have water 
like your refracted angle based on the normal line here would be 90 degrees. And so that's kind of where you start to observe the critical angle at that point. And then um, based on that, you can say like N1 sine theta one equal to N2 sine theta two, where sine theta two, like your angle for the water interface then would be 90 degrees because that's where you observe the critical angle. And the N2 is obviously just N2. Um, and then, so that's N2 is 1.33 times sine 90, and sine 90 is just 1, and then um, n1 sine theta 1, right, um, we would have the oil index of refraction, which is the 1.42, and then multiplied by sine theta, and theta is pretty much what we're looking for here. So if you do that, then you should see 1.33 divided by 1.42, and that's equal to sine theta one. And then you can just take the inverse sine of that to figure out your critical angle. So 1.33 divided by 1.42, and that should give you your 69.5 degrees. Now, let me draw this up on the board here in a sec. So what you see with the oil and the water, right? Coming down here with this ray, use the oil, use the water, right? When you experience that total return of reflection, Basically what happens is that this ray never actually goes through the water. What happens is that it gets completely reflected, right? It just bounces off perfectly this way, right? Um, and so that happens pretty much like when you're at like this maximum um, ref refracted angle. So it'll happen when like you have this incident ray coming in and it just kind of falls flat here. That would be the maximum angle for the second surface. Um, that's relative to the normal line, right? So you're basically looking at like where you observe that maximum angle in that scenario. So the second angle should be at that maximum of nine degrees where you'll start to observe that critical angle or you start to observe that total reflection. And then um, you can kind of just use Snell's law to figure that out. So I think that's probably the best way to do it um, if that critical angle formula is not working out. So if you have like that N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two, right? So N1 would be that first <laughs> surface, that first um, index of refraction, which is the oil, which is 1.42, right? Times sine theta. We want to figure out what this angle is, which is the critical angle that we're looking for, to cause this type of refraction, we're saying, um, or what would cause the total internal reflection. But then our second surface, N2, is the water, right? That was 1.33. And we observe this critical angle when we have this refracted angle of 90 degrees. Because that'll be just the next. Because at that point, like, then you'll start to have it go at 90, whatever. Like, it'll just kind of go upwards again, it'll be the um, reflection. So if you do that, you should see this will be sine 90, just 1. And so you divide over the 1.42. So this is, yeah, this is still n2 over n1, basically. And then sine of theta 1, and you take the inverse sine of that to figure out. And I'm not sure why that wasn't working, I guess, because, um, I don't know. I just, I'm, maybe I'm stupid, I just plugged it in correctly, I just didn't realize. Yeah, and two is your water, that's just 1.33, right? And one is your oil, so it's 1.4, I think I just plugged it in wrong, to be honest. So one, yeah, 1.33 divided by 1.42, so you can just, yeah, honestly, you just use the formula, and that's fine. But either way, if they ask you to show your work with Snell's Law, you know how to do it. Yeah, I don't know what I was doing. I don't, maybe I was just in the, um, anyway. But yeah, so I, I, if they ask you to solve it either way, um, now you kind of know how to visualize it and also understand the concept of total internal reflection as well. But. I am Mustafa. <laughs> um, let's see here. So let me just Reggie, all here. your messages <laughs> scammed you. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but, okay, so I'm that is heartbeat. I'm just kidding. So that is the refracted, oh, no, that's the critical angle. So now we're done with problem eight um, with this oil and water stuff, right? Problem nine is the lenses. Um, let's see here. I don't know, should I? Start writing on the right here because I feel like this is a lot. 
You could. Yeah. I probably should. It's just a line. But it's an infinite what? canvas. <laughs> just a little line. All right. So this is problem nine. Lens and mirror. So an object, green arrow, is placed in front of a thin converging lens with a focal length of three centimeters as shown. Each division on the axis represents two centimeters. Okay. I don't know if I should just draw this out. That's fine. On a um, green line. Yeah. And we have a converging lens like that. Ooh, what a great lens. Um, we have our focal length over here, focal length over there, roughly. But now they want us to use ray tracing to find the location of the image due to the lens. All right, so we said the focal length was three centimeters. Um, each tick mark on the graph is two centimeters. Okay, and then we want to use ray tracing to figure out the location of the image. Um, they have the location of the object as four centimeters from that converging lens. Now you have to start doing like these rays. For lenses, there are three principal rays, but for mirrors, there are four. Um, they're kind of similar to what you see with the mirrors, but basically, hold on, I should, should I draw it on the board first and then on my iPad? What are you, are you recording it? Like yeah, recording? no, I'm re like I'm recording right now, yeah. How about um, the screen record then? Are you like, is your camera yeah. on? No, no, I'm just like recording my no, iPad then screen. Just do so. it Okay, um, I'll do that and I'll just write it on the board here in a second, as I've been doing. Um, but let's see here. So it's kind of hard to do this without like, you know what? I have an idea. Let me erase this real quick. And then let me just take a screenshot of this graph here and then I'll paste that into the yeah, because you need the right um, yeah. measurements. Or like the right scale. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Where is that problem? Okay, there we go. Let me take a screenshot and then just drag that over. There we go. Okay. So... If we were to do this right, let me just choose different colors for this stuff. So we have one ray um, that kind of goes just straight parallel to the optical axis, and then it'll go straight through the um, focal point like this. Uh, hold up, let me adjust that. Sort of like this, right? And then you have one principal ray that's going to be going just straight through the center of the actual lens itself. So if you watched um, my video or you looked at my slides for the principal rays for concave and convex mirrors, I named them <laughs> like in a very weird way, sometimes like based on like a movie name. So um, this one, like going through the center like this, I just called that journey to the center of the earth because it'll just go through the center of the lens. Um, so you that's just that, how you... Isn't that B for Vendetta? Well, no, there's one that just would go like through the center and then like reflect like that. But this one goes just th straight through the center. Um, and then it'll converge with the other, with the other rays as well. Now, um, with these lenses, you also have another uh, ray. This is the third principal ray. And that'll just go through the focal length first um, on the same side of the object and then continue until it hits the lens and then just kind of move parallel to the optical axis like that. So roughly, they what, should kind of converge. I don't know, all right? I'm like, I am trying to just do my best with this. Because eventually, like, <laughs> it's just all based on, like, your drawing. So it doesn't, like, really matter, like, as long as it looks right. Plus, like, you'll have a ruler on the exam. You're required to have a ruler on the exam, I'm pretty sure. And you might to, want to remind people to bring yeah. a ruler. Reminder, please bring a ruler, everyone. Um, but yeah, that, I think, it doesn't, like, really matter. I, won't, I guess it does, but still, as long as you're, as long as you're clearly, clearly drawing the rays correctly, you should be okay. Because I feel like if it's like near yeah. what they have on like mm -hmm. their answer key, because they won't ask you to, they won't ask you to like 
based on the principal rays, like tell us the opt or the image distance or something like that, they'll ask you to do the image distance based on the lens maker equation instead, which is the one over focal length plus one over the object distance plus one over the image distance. But or roughly, just, or just the lens. yeah, um, but roughly something like this, but that's how you kind of draw these rays. Um, so that's part A. Part B, and actually, you know what? Let me actually go ahead and draw this. Completely off, and then they'll be like, okay, you drew something wrong. Mm -hmm. Object over here, right? We had this optical axis, and then we had a converging lens here. So you have one ray just directly parallel to the optical axis, and then it goes through the focal point, like this, right? Um, you have another ray that just goes straight through the middle of the, or through the center of the um, converging lens, and you have another ray. That'll go through the other focal point first. Well, if I drew the lens a little bit better, but basically like that. It'll, once it hits the lens, then it just goes straight parallel to the optical axis. So you'll see it, they kind of like converge like somewhere over here, or whatever, right? So those are the th three principal rays. For either mirrors or lenses, usually you can just draw two. Um, if you know two really well, because some of them like get really confusing, especially when you do like diverging lenses and um, convex mirrors. Uh, mm -hmm. It was kind of going like away, like out of the page, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure. Mine went out of the page too. Yeah, the those for style. the diverging lenses and for convex mirrors are difficult to like look at because they obviously don't <laughs> converge at an actual point. So you have to draw those like dotted lines to like show where the image like seems to originate from. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean converging lenses and concave mirrors are far easier to do. Um, and usually those will be the ones that you'll get on the exams. No, like no promises that's what pops Hopefully. up, but um, yeah, I, ho I hope it's a converging lens or a concave well, uh, mirror. They might put a two lens system. No, yes, I don't they know. Will. For eye, for eyes, but in that case, like you're not even asked to like double no, no, the image what, or anything like that. Like, yeah, no, it, they'll probably just ask you because I think it was like somewhere like on the practice problems, mm -hmm. like just like they give you two lenses, but then like you don't have to ray trace or anything because ray tracing can be confusing yeah. for two lenses. But like, you where will like, your image first distance. image yeah. and the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a problem like this that one on the exam, but yeah, I don't think they'll ask you to like ray do a bunch of like ray tracing for that mm -hmm. because. Number one, it's, it's kind of a hassle time. to yeah. like do it with the ruler and everything. You have a limited space with the desk too. Um, and at the same time, just like extra work that is not necessary because just knowing how to draw lines isn't like an indication of anything. Like they want to see that you understand like how to apply these equations and that you understand like how images and objects kind of relate to each other. Well, also like um, magnification. Like yeah, exactly. Like do but you know what image distance is? Do you know what object distance is? Yeah. Like if you have a converging or diverging, is your focal length positive mm -hmm. or negative? Exactly, especially the focal that, length, yeah. like being positive or negative, understanding like difference between diverging, converging lenses, concave, convex <laughs> mirrors with respect to whether they have a positive or negative focal length, what it means to have a negative or positive image distance. Um, so usually like whenever you see negative distances or negative values with like these lenses stuff, um, it's gonna be diverging lenses and convex mirrors because um, those will produce like virtual images. So virtual images will have negative image distances, uh, convex mirrors and diverging lenses will have negative focal lengths. Um, so like just anything that's like not real is negative. <laughs> like it's just like, that's how we can define it. Anything that's not real is negative. Dotted lines aren't real. Um, yeah, dotted lines are not real. But now they're asking us to like figure out whether the image is real or virtual. And that just like, first of all, easy way you can figure this out. Like if you don't understand anything, um, is look at the object position relative to the focal point. If it's anywhere behind the focal point, for a converging lens that is, then you know that it's going to be a real image. Now, here's the trick though, because if they have the object placed between the focal point and the uh, lens, that is the only time where you have a converging lens or a concave mirror have a virtual 
uh, image. I was about to say so, for the mirror, it's like if it's in front of the focal yep. point for the mm -hmm. concave. So concave mirrors. Caving in. Mm -hmm. Or converging lenses if object is between focal length and mirror then virtual image mm -hmm. and i think i had like a table or a chart or something or I, maybe i just listed it out um on my slides as well as like i sent um a couple of links that i found while studying for the mcat for the um optics yeah all the optics stuff like the combination like when you know like if you have um, a divergent converging lens when like what kind of image is formed like with small upright virtual real like that SUV. um and so that i think is really helpful because you might get like a multiple choice question that'll be like hey what type of image is formed here and Choose all that apply. yeah so <laughs> it's i think it's really nice to have those like memorized or like just some working memory because then you can just look at an image and be like oh it's virtual it's real um because that could really save you some points because you might not like really be sure of your ray tracing or something. So like what like if you screw up your ray tracing, but you know like the object's position and like what it should produce, then like the second question, like part A, you screwed up the ray tracing, right? Let's say you produced a virtual image on accident, right? But you know the context is like based on the position of the object and everything, you know it should be a real image, then you can just say it's a real image and you get what? Two points there instead of missing all five, right? So, um, so this is a real image too because you can clearly see that the um, light rays are converging at a real point. That's an easy way to say it. Um, otherwise, like because the object is placed before the focal point, then you know, since it's a converging lens as well, then you have a real image produced. I think another rule of thumb is like for lenses, at least if your image is on the other side of the lens, it's real, right? For lenses, yeah. 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 And then if you're, mirrors, if it's, it's on, on the, the end, it's on the other end, then it's real. If it's on the same side, yeah. then it's virtual. Right. And same. It's opposite for mirrors because yeah. mirrors would be same side, mm -hmm. real, opposite, virtual. But yeah. Um, part C is asking now for what is it? Um, using the thin lens equation to determine the exact location of the image, right? So once again, like I said, they're not going to ask you to just use the ray tracing to figure out the image distance because like there's so much variation to it that um, it'll be difficult to figure things out, especially considering like, I remember when we had our exam, the tick marks were kind of hard to see. Of so course. it would have been course. like, cause like the print just, the printer just didn't work properly. So um, yeah, I don't think they ever will have you like just determine things based on the tick marks. So you're just gonna be using the equation instead. Right. Do you think um, they'll ask us lens maker? It wasn't on the equation sheet for the quiz. Um, if it's not in the equation sheet, then probably not. But Let me check the equation sheet. What okay. do I want to say? Is good there are some things that, like, I think that you should have memorized, um, mm -hmm. are incredibly helpful to have memorized, especially when you get to. We talked about this earlier with the nuclear, um, like the radioactive decay stuff. Oh, alpha beta decay. There's further for the activity, like the R value, you have to be able to um, have your units and everything in seconds but your half-lives are often in years. So you have to convert from years to seconds. And if you like do that manually and just write that out on the exam, like it's not a hard calculation by any means, but it's just gonna take up a lot of space, mm -hmm. let alone a lot of time. Um, so if you just know that, where's my pencil? There we go. Um, There's no lens maker. But... Okay, cool. Um, 3.15 times, yeah, 3.15 times 10 to the seventh seconds in one year. So that's the amount of seconds in one year, 3.15 times 10 to the seventh. Uh, if you know that really well, like then you don't have to like recalculate how many seconds in a year for that stuff on the exam. I think that's probably a really important like secret piece of information that you should just like have memorized, I think, because it just makes things so much quicker on the exam for those nuclear type problems. Do you think they'll ask us a lot of nuclear problems? Because we like There's, just learned it. You know what I mean? It's a guarantee that you'll have one of those, right. like one of the long problems, and you might have like one or two short problems on it. Fair. Um, but it, like, what, what did you guys do for the um, last chapter for the unit one? 
like with thermodynamics. Oh, that was the Boltzmann's <laughs> distribution. Yeah, so like that, problem, you yeah. guys like saw that. That was all like just equations. Like but you it was barely one, had to understand question, anything. It exactly. Was just a long problem. So it's very equation based. Like if you understand this half life stuff, like just how to like manipulate the equation, and everything, you should be fine. There's not like any real explanation that you have to do. <clears throat> the only thing I would say is um, understanding alpha, beta, like gamma decay, decay gamma decay, the, gamma decay. Um, they have it on the equation sheet, but like the way they define it is like yeah, not just really saw good. It. It, was, it was weird the way yeah. they, just, they worded it. Um, I'll write it here in a sec once we get to this nuclear problem, but yeah, I think it's far better to just like. Gamma is the easiest one. Yeah. Um, but going back, so this is part C. So, like, like I said, I think it's really important to just know this for the nuclear stuff, but I'll erase this here for a second because it's not relevant to the problem. Um, let's see here. So, using le thin lens equations, so we have 1 over F. Is one over is equal to one over di plus one over do. We know that the object distance was four centimeters, right? So that's one over four, and then the focal length they said was three centimeters. So that's one over three, and then we're trying to figure out the uh, image distance, right? So, with that, four over twelve here, one over di plus three over twelve, then one over di is just one over twelve here. And then di would just be positive 12 centimeters. So always, when you're doing the thin lens equation and stuff, um, use like your final like value and your result as a sanity check because it also really helps to just visualize um, and make sure that it makes sense with your drawing, with what you said if the image was virtual or real. Because let's say you screwed up the ray tracing, but you didn't realize. Um, you know that it's a real image, and your image distance is positive, so you know that also is a real image then you can go back and check your drawing and redo it to fix that, for example. Um, or you might have your drawing completely right. You might have said it was virtual, and then your image distance says otherwise. Like, it's still real. So you can go back and adjust that. So they all kind of relate to, like, help give you, like, a solid answer. So those three parts there, A, B, and C, are very, like, related to one another. Um, but, yeah. And then, let's see here. Part D is okay so we have a convex mirror is to the right is added to the right of the previous lens as pictured um point fm is the mirror's focal point all right um so this is a convex mirror so what does that mean for our focal length if we have a convex mirror Yeah, so the, is, does that mean, is it, is it a positive focal length or like a negative focal length? Negative, right, excellent. So it should be a negative focal length for a convex mirror. Um, so that's point FM. So it says, use ray tracing now to find the location on the picture of the final image due to the mirror. All right, so this is where things get a little confusing, right? Because this is where we were talking about earlier where we have like multiple lens system or like a lens in a mirror or something like that, right? So the way they had it here set up is let me actually just take another screenshot again of this. So let me drag that over here. And I'll draw it up on the board here in a second. But so we have the image was located like somewhere around here. Okay. And now um, they want us to figure out the new image that's produced as a result of this convex mirror, right? So now we're just going to be using the principal rays that we know for um, a convex or for convex or concave mirrors. So those four principal rays. And remember, you only have to draw two of them, right? You only have to draw two of them. So um, for this, the way we can do it, right, is we have one ray that is going to be just straight up, just parallel to the optical axis. Let me do a different color here. Right? And that is going to be um, reflected from or bounced off from the convex mirror. Now for this ray, um, let me go back to my slides here just to make sure that I'm like referencing the right ray. Hello. Hello. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, let's see here. So, all right. Um, what did I want to say here? 
Yeah, yeah. So you have one ray. This is your first principal ray, um, and I called this one, I think, Back to the Future. Now it's a little bit different for a convex mirror because you still go directly parallel to the optical axis, but then you get reflected. You get immediately bounced off of the mirror. Now the angle or like. The way that you bounce it off should perfectly align with the focal point on the other end. Yep. So yep. if I draw this, it should be kind of like a dotted line going straight through that what focal point. Line? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then, um, so that's the first principal ray, right? Now, like I said, you can use whichever ones you want. It just depends on this scenario, the situation that you have, and what like um, things you have access to. So um, what I want to say, like, you have oh, next principal ray. Um, yeah, but I'm trying to think what I called it. I can't remember. Vertex. No, no, no. All I remember is Something we like that. that up. Uh, there was one that wasn't a movie name. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember it now. Um, it was like. Slide to the Slide left. left. Yep. Yeah, that's like, the one. It was some sort of it's like some really goofy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but for slide to the left, basically, like you want to have your ray going towards the mirror, almost like about to hit or in alignment with the um, with the focal point on the other end. But as soon as it hits the mirror, because it's a convex mirror, it just bounces off. So you'll have it where it's like. Let me choose a different. Uh, there we go. So you have it where it's supposed to be kind of in alignment with the focal point on the other end, but then it just immediately slides to the left like this, right? So um, what I want to do here? Ah, here we go. So basically, this you should have another parallel parallel line on this end as well, and then wherever these two like rays kind of intersect or seemingly intersect, that's where your image is formed and that's also like the height of your image too, right? So this is the image height or image length in this case, I guess, but um, you can see that some people will say like, look at this and say that it's inverted, but the thing is relative to your first object, the green arrow, the black arrow was inverted relative to that one because it's flipped, but then this other image, the yellow arrow here, that is not inverted relative to the black arrow because you kept the same um, orientation. You haven't flipped it to be upright again. So you went from upright to inverted and then from inverted to inverted. So that's not flipping it or inverting it again, basically. So it's not flipped over again. Um, but now you see that with a convex mirror once again or with like diverging lenses, you don't have the light rays converging at an actual point at a real point. They only seemingly converge um, at some other point, like behind the mirror in this case. So in this case, you have them converging at that point, And then um, basically, we can say that this image is going to be virtual, which is what part E is asking for. So we did the ray tracing here. Now for part E, they're asking whether it's um, virtual or not. And no, we know that it's virtual, because with a convex mirror, the light rays are not going to be converging at an actual point um, and forming a real image. Rather, the, um, the image that's formed, like the light rays seemingly, seemingly originate from that specific image or that specific point. So it seems to come from that location, right? So this is virtual. Um, and finally, for this problem, we use the mirror equation again, I think just to figure out the exact location of this new image. Um, so. 1 over f, again, is equal to 1 over di plus 1 over do. And then the f that we're using is the focal length of the, um, the convex mirror, right? So you said, what was the focal length for that one again? Six centimeters. I see it now. It's six centimeters. So remember that it's negative six centimeters, though, because we're talking about a convex mirror. So 1 over negative 6 is equal to 1 over the image distance, which is what we're trying to figure out, plus 1 over the object distance. So the object distance is a little bit confusing now because we have the um, image that was formed previously act as our object now. So our object distance should be 
this black arrow located here. So from this converging lens to this mirror, um, we have a distance of 15 centimeters, but now we're trying to figure out basically like how far this is. This is our like object distance because our, our old image acts as our object for the second scenario here. So this object distance would just be like wherever the um, original image was located and then we kind of measure relative to that. So in this case, like you have 15 centimeters as the distance between the lens and the mirror. And then we know from the previous part that the image distance that was formed, like this black arrow here was 12 centimeters relative to the, um, the converging lens. So from like here to here, it was 12 centimeters. So now we're trying to measure things like our object distance for the second scenario should be based on the distance from the mirror itself, not from the lens. So in this case, the new object distance would be this three centimeter distance right here. And that's what we plug in for the second equation. <clears throat> so um, plus one over three, right? And it's gonna be positive because that's our object now. And one over di is what we're trying to figure out here. Oops. And we have one over negative six. <clears throat> Um, so this is 1 over di plus 2 over 6, and then minus 1 over 6 here. And then it'll just be negative 3 over 6 is equal to 1 over di, right? And that just gives us di is equal to negative 2 centimeters. And this once again checks out because we should have a virtual image here and virtual image distance, or image distances that are negative are virtual images that are formed. So that all checks out for that problem. Now... Last problem of this exam is the nuclear decay stuff. So let me kind of shift this off to the little right here. So nuclear decay, you have plutonium isotope, 239 atomic mass and 94 um, mass number, right? has a mass of 239.052 atomic mass units. It decays via alpha decay into an isotope um, of uranium. With a half-life of 24,000 years, each decay releases 5.2 mega electron volts of energy. So we have half-life, T1 half, is your 24,000 years, right? We know it's alpha decay that we're dealing with here, which I'm gonna get into that here in a second, but it decays into an isotope of uranium, cool, and the amount of energy that's released, right, is 5.2 mega electron volts. So when we're dealing with like energy release, we can also think about the binding energy because you need to overcome that binding energy to obviously have that energy that's released, right? So we can relate this energy release to the binding energy, and there's a specific equation to figure that out right, or use that information, because um, for part A, they're asking us for the binding energy. So binding energy here, right, um, is just equal to mc squared, right? So this is where we get the E equals mc squared famous equation from. So um, the m here is the change in the mass that you observe. So I'm not sure, is it on the equation sheet? Which one? Um, like the um, mass of like a neutron and stuff like that. Probably, let me check. Because mass of hydrogen is like pretty standard, like everyone knows, or at least most people should know that's like 1.008. I feel like we should get like a periodic table or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, Just for like the alpha, beta, decay stuff. Um, you say mass e of a hydrogen atom? No, massive like a neutron. I think it's about the same. Like, yeah, it's, they do have it. It's 1.008665. Okay, they have it on the equation sheet? Yeah, okay, they, awesome. They have proton plus electron mm -hmm. um, for the mass of hydrogen. Okay. It's all on the equation sheet. Um, let's see here. I want to look and just confirm something real quick. How many seconds start in a year? So, I was looking through, and that's like one of the problems was asking for. I don't remember what it was asking. On the homework? On the exam. On the exam. It was like something in the homework sheet. It's like the case. Uh, okay, so. Um, 
I think I just misspoke earlier. I said like that binding energy was the same as the energy released by each decay. That's not the same, my bad. Um, so, okay, so now we're just trying to figure out the binding energy here. So we have E equals MC squared. This is delta M by the way. And we're just looking for the change in mass. Um, and that'll just be, it's whatever total mass of hydrogen you have, plus whatever total mass of the neutrons that you have, and then minus the um, like mass of the uh, plutonium like isotope in this case, right? So the reason why they do like mass of hydrogen is that it'll just approximate the mass of a proton in this case, I guess. So, um, but you have what 94 hydrogen atoms in this case, or 94 protons, really. And so that's 94 times um, like one point, you say 007825, right? Mm -hmm. Atomic mass units, right? And then plus uh, 145 neutrons times 1.008665 atomic mass units. And you can get that by just looking at um, the difference between the amount of protons that you have and the atomic mass number. So you have a mass number of 239. So 239 minus 94, that should give you 145 neutrons. And then you subtract just by the um, atomic mass number that they gave you here, which is the 239.051634. Uh, and then just multiplied by C squared. C is the speed of light. Um, but for these, I think it's probably just easier to just simplify it down to this. So they have it where um, basically you want this binding energy to be in mega electron volts. So instead of like doing your speed of light and just doing a whole bunch of other conversions, um, there's just an easy simplification for this, which you can just replace the C squared with like 931, was it? Mm -hmm. Point something for yeah, the... Yeah, um, like Yeah. So... Um, you take this whole thing and just like essentially just multiply it by 931.49 um, mega electron volts instead of the C squared here. What would you do without me? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is pretty much it for that part. And I think you should get what, 18, roughly like 1800 um, mega electron volts for that. Now, that's per nucleon right so or my bad that's for the whole thing um for the entire nucleus and if you want for each nucleon then you take this and you divide it by um the mass number so that 239 and that'll give you roughly like 7.5 mega electron volts per nucleon for the binding energy so that's part a um part b is far simpler because they're just asking about like, really just the definition of alpha decay here. Um, so they'll ask you to determine the mass number and the atomic number of the resulting isotope of uranium in this decay. So they said it was alpha decay, right? Yeah, alpha decay. So with alpha decay, you'll see a, um, a decrease in the number of protons that you have by two, um, and then a decrease in the mass number by four. So you had 94 protons, now you have 92, and you had 239, like, that is your mass number, and then you just subtract by 4. Um, that gives you 235 as your new mass number as well. But that's not too bad. And there's usually, like, one part like this that should be easy points if you um, remember, like, the alpha, beta, gamma decay stuff. Um, I don't know, the definition on the equation sheet is a little weird, so I'd recommend, like, sort of like memorizing these before the exam and maybe just writing it out on the equation sheet like once you go in because it's going to be really helpful to like figure that out um but yeah now we have part c it says a suit particle has enough plutonium to have an activity of 2.75 becquerels remember becquerels is a measurement of activity right and that's in units of like decays per second um it says person inhales a suit particle and all the energy of the decay is absorbed by five grams of tissue in a lung if inhaled, decays of plutonium have an RBE value of 10. Um, RBE was like registered like biological something. I can't remember what it was. Let me pull it up. Uh, so 
what was it? Registered biological something. Let's see here. Or maybe it's not registered, maybe I'm like just tripping. Um, relative biological effectiveness. I don't know why I said registered. <laughs> um, relative biological effectiveness. Um, you don't like really have to like know all the details of what that is because that's just a lot of stuff to to like look at. Yeah. <laughs> so that's RBE, relative biological effectiveness. Um, a lot of the stuff, like I said, is just if you understand how to use the equations, you don't necessarily have to like know all the ins and outs and the details of this stuff. Um, just know like what they say or what they mean by RBE. Otherwise, like you're screwed. Um, so for Part C, they're asking for how much total energy in joules is absorbed uh, during a period of five years. Assume that the activity doesn't change during that period. So they want us to figure out total energy in a period of five years, right? And they gave us an activity, an R value of 2.75 becquerels. And that's just saying like 2.75 decays per second, basically. Um, now, what do I want to say? So they told us earlier in the problem that for each decay, you have 5.7 mega electron volts or 5.2 mega electron volts is released by each decay so over what a period of five years that's going to be some amount of seconds right we can figure that out here in a second um so let's say like i don't know like a million seconds whatever right not not accurate but let's say a million seconds just give a number out so we'll have a million seconds right and then um we can multiply that by the activity that'll get us the total number of decays in that period of time. And then if we multiply by the um, energy per decay, that gives us the total energy that should be um, absorbed because whatever's released is just absorbed again. So, um, but yeah. So we have 2.75 decays per second, right? Now, what do I wanna say? So we have five years. Remember, I think this is probably really important to like know this. In one year, you have 3.15 times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. So if you do this, that should give you the number of seconds. Um, let me double check that here. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, like I think they also have it in the key as 1.57 times 10 to the 8 seconds, roughly. And then we can just multiply that by 2.75 decays per second. That'll give us the number of decays, which is around 4.3 times 10 to the eighth. And then we can just multiply that by the activity, or by the, um, the uh, energy per decay. So 5.2 mega electron volts times, or per decay, times 4.3 times 10 to the eighth. And then that should give you um, your energy. Now, we're dealing with mega electron volts and they want things to be in um, values of joules actually, right? So first of all, mega electron volts, that's gonna just be times 10 to the sixth electron volts. Um, and then from that, we know that each electron volt, uh, what was it like, what was the conversion factor again? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules? Yeah. So yeah, one electron volt is 1.6 times out of the negative 19 joules. And then if you do that, you should get your answer in joules, which is like 3.6 times out of the negative four joules, I believe. Now, that is the energy absorbed there for C. And then finally for D is very simple. Um, once again, it just requires you to know some of this stuff. Um, so I highly recommend going back into the reading and reading about the um, relative biological effectiveness and the dose and what a gray unit is and, and stuff like that. Um, but they're asking for the radiation dose equivalent. And so that's just, let me actually double check the equation here because I, I myself have forgotten it. Uh, okay, dose equivalent. Um, dose in grays times your 
uh, relative biological effectiveness, right? So we just need our dose in grays and then multiply that by the RBE. So to get your dose in grays, right? Um, where's it again? The energy divided by the mass, right? Yeah. Yeah, one gray is a joule per kilogram. So we just need to figure out how many joules per kilogram there are to figure out how many grays there are. So we had 3.6 times 10 to the negative 4 joules, and then divided by the mass, really, of um, the dosage here, right? So we have 5 grams, um, or not, yeah, 5 grams of tissue, that's what I meant. 5 grams of tissue, which is 5 times um, 10 to the negative 3 kilograms, and that'll give us the number of grays, because grays is just going to be the... Um, it's just going to be in units of joules per kilogram. That's the SI units for it. So um, if you do that, you should get the number of grays, which is like 0 0.07 grays. And grays is just abbreviated as GY. And if you just multiply that by the RBE, which is 10, you get 0.7 roughly as your um, radiation dose equivalent. So that is the entirety of exam one so i'll probably just end the recording here and then take a break here in a second and then move on to exam two but yeah